name is Kirby Stafford. I'm Vice Director and Chief Entomologist at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station in New Haven. I am also the State Entomologist. This evening I'm here to uh, talk about Lyme disease and tick control, concentrating on its biology, epidemiology, and mainly methods that you can do to prevent uh, tick bites, uh, control ticks, and reduce your chances of getting Lyme disease. Um, as you know, this is our first Thursday Nature Seminar. We do it every first Thursday, so keep an eye out for the next month and the month after. This month, we're fortunate to have Dr. Kirby Stafford with us. He's the Vice Director at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and he's done a lot of um, research on ticks and Lyme disease and control of them and so on. And, and Hopefully I won't cry, but most of you know, I lost my dog to Lyme and Fridays four years ago. So this is near and dear to my heart. Um, as Dr. Stafford and I were talking earlier, fortunately or unfortunately, um, Lyme and Fridays is something that just attacks the, the, uh, the dogs. And um, I guess the fortunate part is it doesn't go for people. But certainly something that we need to be aware of in order to ensure that our animals are safe. So thank you, Dr. Stafford. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, this evening I'm going to be talking about ticks and Lyme disease and some of the other diseases that we carry with a focus on giving a little history background, uh, you know, where Lyme disease came from, uh, the biology of the tick, which is important to understand, and then I'll be talking about various control measures to reduce your risk of getting Lyme disease. But before I do that, I just want to give a brief update. I'm from the Kinetic Agricultural Experiment Station. This was the first agricultural experiment station established in the United States back in 1875. Uh, we're governed by a board of control. Uh, we were actually for two years at Westland, uh, and our current structure was established, and we moved down uh, to New Haven in 1882. We have six departments plus a valley laboratory up in Windsor, a research laboratory and a small research farm out in uh, Griswold. Uh, analytical chemistry is a department that analyzes uh, a lot of materials from various different state agencies. They're also part of uh, FDA's Food Emergency Response Network. And in fact, the FDA called them in to do analysis of a lot of seafood from the Gulf after the oil spill there. Uh, biochemistry and genetics does some basic research. I'm head of the Department of Entomology. A lot of our work uh, is focused on forest insects, uh, although we cover a lot of different my specialty is ticks. Uh, environmental sciences uh, is a department that uh, actually runs our statewide mosquito uh, surveillance program and does all the testing of the mosquitoes for West Nile virus, uh, Eastern Equine, and Cephalitis virus, and so forth. So when you hear the pronouncements about positive mosquitoes, they were tested in our laboratory. Forestry and horticulture, from their name, does research in those two areas. And plant pathology and ecology deals with plant diseases. We have two uh, diagnostic labs. One is our insect inquiry office, where we'll identify any kind of insect problems a person is having, having and suggest ways to deal with it. And then our Department of Plant Pathology has a diagnostic lab uh, as well to diagnose plant diseases. So that's a service that we offer. Additional thing, we do tick testing, nursery inspections. I'm also the state plant regulatory official. Hats that I wear. We do all the nursery inspections. Some nurseries can ship, um, you know, plants uh, out of state by phytosanitary certificates that it's clean. Uh, you know, the nursery industry is a big industry uh, here uh, in Connecticut, so we do have a lot of a lot of different programs. Here's our laboratory. Valley Laboratory is up in Windsor. We have a 75-acre research farm in Hamden, Connecticut. In fact, yesterday we had our annual plant science day. It's a huge open house. People are free to come down to their research talks and their talks and things like that. Uh, all day. It's always the first Wednesday in August. Our main laboratory is in New Haven and our Griswold Research uh, Center out well, in Griswold. So with that commercial, I'll get on to the main subject for this evening. Uh, and that's Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is a leading arthropod-associated disease in the United States. So if you look at the figures here, you'll see a lot of these others are tick-associated as well. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Anaplasmosis or Lichiosis or tick-borne diseases, Ephesiosis, Powassan Encephalitis, Tularemia can be tick-borne, 
Out west, tick-borne relapsing fever, Colorado tick fever. So ticks can carry a lot of different pathogens. Uh, we also have a smaller degree, even with the advent of West Nile, uh, the number of cases is much less than Lyme disease. And we get a few cases of malaria from people traveling overseas that occur. But Lyme disease is the big one. If you look at the national statistics since 1982, when they first started uh, taking numbers, you'll see that the number of Lyme disease cases have been steadily increasing. And today there's about you know, 30 to 35,000 cases reported to the CDC every year. Uh, and it's kind of fluctuating now. But that's probably only about 10% of the diagnosed cases. Many cases of Lyme disease are simply not reported. The physicians don't report them. So it is an underreported disease. So basically, we probably have somewhere around 300 to 350,000 diagnosed cases in this area. Here in Connecticut, you'll see a similar trend in the number of increasing cases. Uh, the state had laboratory-based reporting. You understand most cases of Lyme disease are physician-based reporting. In other words, a physician, di a physician diagnosed someone with Lyme disease, they fill out a form and it goes to the state health department. And then it's and it'll be confirmed. Um, laboratory reporting means the laboratories are required to report any positive Lyme tests they have, and then the state health department has to follow back up with the physician. So they had laboratory reporting, they dropped it for a few years, and that had an impact on the number of cases that were actually documented. They reinstituted laboratory reporting, uh, and that's what you see uh, there in the purple and yellow. And they call them confirmed and portable cases. It's just a, uh, it's a hierarchy of evidence for a diagnosis of Lyme disease, and that's how most diseases actually are reported. The drop during this period, oddly enough, was not only in the laboratory reporting, but Tick numbers actually went down that year, but as you'll see as we progress, tick numbers do fluctuate from year to year. And this year was actually a low year for tick numbers. So you'll have a big year, and then you'll have a smaller year, and that's a cool year. So you saw the numbers over time. If you look at it geographically, back in 1984 and 85, actually the first tests for Lyme disease were actually developed at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. And so 8485, working with the health department, free testing was offered to physicians across the state. Now the base that gave us our first glimpse of the distribution of disease here in the state. Remember, Lyme disease was recognized from a cluster of cases in the Lyme on Lyme area back in, in the mid-1970s. And was first described as Lyme arthritis by Dr. Alan Steer in 1975 and then 77. And so as you can see, 92, you can see it, it's progressed through the state, and of course it's also progressed all through New England. It continues to expand its range, putting more people at risk. So why didn't we work? Why was it, what was so special about Lyme? Well, some areas in the Cape, some areas in Western Canada. Where did Lyme disease come from? Okay. The answer lies in our history of our land use changes in landscape. If you look at Connecticut today, it's largely white. Okay. Now we know from a Swedish naturalist that we came here to the United States uh, in the 1750s. He was here for about like two years. And he traveled extensively and kept this journal of his travels. And he noted that to these I must add the wood lice, which that text. Which, which the forests are so pestered that it's impossible to pass through a bush or sit down that the place would be ever so pleasant without having a whole swarm of them on your gloves. He was in New Jersey at that time, so ticks were abundant. A century later, after he published his travels, the state entomologist in New York at the time, Lisa Fetch, noted that the most common tick of our country, the wood tick, though formerly abundant throughout the northern and middle states, has now become nearly or quite extinct. At this day, along the road, the column pursued not one can probably be found. What happened in that intervening hundred years? Cut the trees down. Cut the trees down. Exactly. If you look at um, Connecticut's forest uh, cover history, you can say well, well, almost 100 percent forest cover, but a steady decline all through the 16 and 1700s as the lands were cut for farming. Wood was used, obviously, for building, for fuel. Um, Agriculture reached its peak in the early 1800s, 
And then as lands opened up out west, a lot of people immigrated to go farming out uh, in the Midwest. We also had our industrial revolution. We also had a lot of people moving to the mill towns. So farmlands were abandoned. And so you've got a recovery, a regrowth of the forest. And today about 58% of the state uh, is forested. Now along with the comeback of the trees and what I'll call the habitat, we also had a return of white-tailed deer. Take a guess how many deer is estimated there were in Connecticut in 1896. Twelve. Twelve deer in the state. They were put it out. There's only twelve deer in the state that were put it out. And as you can see here, about you know, twelve, you can see the deer population has steadily increased you know, all through the 1900s. Uh, the official census is around at 62, 63,000 mark, but it's really, it's recognized as an undercount. And it's estimated there's probably about 120,000 deer in the state today. That's a lot of deer. Probably more deer here now than there were back when the early colonists uh, first arrived, although that's kind of hard to know for sure to determine. And the key reason for that is, is because Basically, what we saw was a comeback of the habitat and a comeback of the host that the tick depends on. We think the tick survived in isolated parts of Long Island, islands off the Cape where deer were not hunted out, and then as conditions returned that were suitable, they reestablished where? On you know, the Lyme area, you know, expanded into the Cape area, into you know, lower New York, Westchester County, and has been expanding ever since. And that's because this tick is closely tied to these animals. And so you have three active stages of our black-legged tick, or deer tick, so these scapulars, as most people don't know it. You have the larval stage, the nymphal stage, and the adult male and female. At this point, I want to just kind of go through the life cycle of the tick. It's what we call a three-host tick. Each stage feeds on a different. So actually what we're going to do is we're going to start with this engorged female over on the far side. She will lay about two to 3,000 eggs. Larval ticks will hatch from those eggs and feed on anything, but primarily the rodents and birds. And they do not carry the Lyme disease organism. It's not passed by the female tick for a progeny. Or it's so very rare as to be not having much. So the larval ticks will feed it, pick up the spirochete when they feed on an infected mouse or chipmunk or certain species of birds. The larval tick will drop off and become molt into a nymphal stage. Again, the nymphal stage feeds primarily on the rodents and birds, but it will feed again on anything, including us. After it feeds, it's had a second chance to become infected. It will drop off, become an adult tick which feeds only on medium to larger animals. So it'll feed on coyotes, it'll feed um, on fox, it'll feed, but primarily white-tailed deer. That is the main post. So the deer are tied to the reproductive success of the tick. They're not responsible for the Lyme transmission of Lyme. The ticks are already infected. Deer actually do not infect ticks that feed on them. So. How many ticks you have depends on how many female ticks feed on, their, on the deer, drop off, and lay all those eggs. How many of you actually become infected depends on their feeding on the mice and chicken. So there are both different dynamics to the life cycle. Do the deer get Lyme disease? Well, they get infected, but no, they don't get Lyme disease. Actually, the deer immune system is very efficient in eliminating spider cats. So they will mount an antibody response. You can test deer for whether they've been exposed to the Lyme organism, but they don't. They can't carry it like the mice do and transmit it to ticks that are feeding on it. So let's just kind of review that real quick. Here is a female tick laying her mass of eggs. <coughs> Here in the grass, if you look carefully, you can see the outline of an engorged female tick. She has laid an egg mass and the larval ticks are hatching from that. So you got two to three thousand eggs in one spot. Don't pick that spot and have your picture flush. However, if you get a lot of larval ticks on you, it's very disconcerting, but it won't have any bearing on whether you get, you know, Lyme disease or not. The larvae, again, 
doing this feed primarily on rodents and birds. And if you look at the ears on this white-footed mouse here that I'm holding, you'll see the marble ticks feeding on that animal. If you look at the very over there, you'll see the ticks around the eyes on that animal. Birds are heavily parasitized by this tick. And some birds, not all birds, it varies by species, can infect the ticks that feed on them. Robins can, gray catbirds cannot. Carolina wrens can, wood thrushes cannot. So it's not a blanket thing, it does actually vary. I did a big study quite a number of years ago looking at infection rates. We took 5,000 ticks off 5,000 birds and documented how many were coming infected. And there's been some other studies that have been done as well. And they don't, they're like a mouse, which is in, pretty much infected for life, birds seem to carry it for a certain window. So they're only infectious for, say, like two weeks or maybe or so. So seasonally, then, larva, nymph, and adult, you'll have the larvae emerge. The eggs are laid in May. The larval ticks will hatch from those about mid to late July. August, this month, is the peak month for uh, larval tick activity. So mid-July, then peaking in August, larval ticks. The larval ticks will feed, they will drop off multiple nymphs, but they won't show up and move as nymphs until the following summer. Nymphs are active in May, May, June, and July, and a little bit in August. And then after those nymphs feed, they drop off molt to adults, which occur in the fall, and also in the spring. The spring population, which seems to get most of the people's attention, is actually a carryover from the fall. I get more calls in the spring than I do in the fall, but you have actually more ticks in the fall than you do in the spring. And I think that's just a, a, a phenomenon of the fact that when it becomes 40 degrees in the fall, it's cold. People put jackets on, people put long pants on. And the spring comes around, hey, it's 40 degrees, and people are out in shorts. You know, I mean, it's just, it just seems to be a recognition phenomenon. But the spring, they don't, they do not hibernate, so they will be active even in the winter months if it's warm. You can pick up a tick on your dog in January or February if it's a nice, you know, nice day. It's 45, the sun's go out, the ticks will be out. They do not hibernate. The interesting thing is, because it's a two year life cycle, seasonally, even though the larva is the first stage, it comes in the late summer. The nymphs come at the beginning of the summer. It's two different populations. The nymphs infect the new generation of mice and chip. And then they're there for the larvae to feed in the late summer. So the ticks give it to the mice, the mice give it to the ticks. And that's how the line is maintained in the wild. Now seasonally, if you look at the incidence of Lyme disease, you'll see that it corresponds with that nice summer months when the nymph will tick. About 70% of people that get Lyme disease get it from that very small medical stage. Not the adults. Even though the infection rate in the adults is higher, they're easier to see. And people tend to find them either before they attach or not too long afterwards. They often miss the nymphs. How many of you know, have ever seen what a nymph tick looks like or what its size is? I'll show you. I'll show you some later. And if you look at Lyme disease incidence by age group, and sometimes it peaks a little higher, you'll see that, you know, children, high rate, lowest rates in the 20s, and then increases through the 40s and 50s. So why don't 20 year olds quite get that too much Lyme disease? Because of the insect ticks. Yeah, they're not out in the woods, are they? <laughs> okay, so children are playing in the woods. You start getting home ownership, you start taking care of yards, raking leaves, you have gardens, and you put yourself more exposed to the potential of tick bite. It's that simple. So what can you do about it? What I'm going to do the rest of the evening, I'm going to talk about some tick management approaches. I've done research in all these areas. And first of all is personal protection measures. You also have an approach where you can reduce the host that the tick uh, reproduces on. You can modify the environment through some landscaping methods to make it less suitable for the tick or its uh, wildlife 
you know, like in other words, I know the idea is to have a wildlife backyard and that kind of stuff, but encouraging the mice and chipmunks potentially could increase tech. So I have a butterfly garden instead, for example. There's approaches to tech. You can spray for ticks. There are host targeted, very specific host targeted insecticides or acaricides. I'll discuss it briefly about that. Host targeted vaccines have been tried experimentally in the field in some studies, but it's not an option at this point. And what I've been doing the past several years is looking at biological and natural control options as alternatives to synthetic chemical insecticides. First thing up is tick bite prevention. And if it's pro done properly, it's very effective. I haven't gotten Lyme disease yet. What's that? I have not gotten Lyme disease. And I've had very few tick bites. I've had a couple of close calls, but I haven't got it yet. And I've taken some ticks off data with full spire keys and partially engorged, but they haven't transmitted yet. So, and it's hot in the summer, but wearing long pants tucked in the socks because most of the ticks are questing down in the low vegetation. They do not jump, they do not fly, and they're not falling from the trees. They're picked up on the lower extremity, and they can be used by how fast as small as they can move them up. Use of the repellent can enhance your protection as well. And so one study was done that showed clearly that doing prevention and tick checks one of the most effective methods of preventing Lyme disease. So after you come back in and you carefully do a tick check, and yes, the numbers are very small, but you can learn to recognize them. And, and you look for them. Now, of course, when you're searching for ticks, the two primary ticks you're going to find potentially attached to you is the deer tick, all stages, or the American dog tick, only the adult stage. The larvae and nymphs of this tick will not feed on us. Most ticks actually are very picky about what hosts they feed on. The problem with the deer tick is it's not so selective. So the dog tick feeds on us as adults. It will only feed on the metabolism and mice as an immature stage. And the dog tick does not carry the line on it. It does not transmit it. And it's easy to tell them apart. So if you see a large tick on your dog, don't automatically assume it's a dog tick. If, yes, the tick is smaller, but OK, here's a male dog tick. Male deer tick, which actually do not attach. Male deer ticks do not require blood meal. It's very rare to find them attached. Female deer tick, female dog tick. But when they become cores, you can see there's not a lot of overlap in size. So the assumption often, if you see a big tick, oh, this is a dog tick. Well, it might be. It might also be a deer tick. Bear in mind that the deer tick is happening in the fall. If you see a tick in the fall, it is a deer tick. Dog ticks emerge in April, mid-April or so, interacting for the first part of the summer. So in the spring, not the very early spring, but the later spring, after mid-April, you'll have both of them out at the same time. But they're easy to tell apart. This dog tick has these white markings on the back, this little plate, that's why they're called hard ticks, actually. And you'll see that plate is still there. So it's very easy to test it. That plain solid black uh, on a deer tick. And if you look at where these ticks attach, the deer tick or black legged tick basically attaches anywhere on the body and finds a place to feed. And when I say anywhere, I literally mean anywhere. Okay? Most of over half of the dog ticks end up feeding. Now, when you come back from being out and, and conducting your uh, tick check, if you uh, use a repellent, you want to wash your skin, wash the clothes. Uh, bear in mind that this tick will survive the wash, but it will not survive the dryer. The deer tick is very susceptible to desiccation or drying out. Dog ticks are tougher, they'll take it longer, but deer ticks are very susceptible to desiccation. They need that high humidity that you find in the leaf litter and forest for That's their normal habitat. So when you come back, you've been doing high risk activities, throw the dryer. If you find a tick, you want to remove it. And the best way is just remove it promptly as possible. I use fine tick forceps. That is a nymphal tick with a common straight pen. For size comparison, that's an engorgement. 
you want to come in with forceps, I come usually come in from the side, I gently grab it right there at the skin as close as I can, and gently in front of me just pull it out. The old wise tails methods of petroleum jelly and the match and all that are not effective. You know, you just get a good pair of forceps and just pull it out. The tick can be saved, it can be tested at the experiment station. We test several thousand ticks a year to see whether they're effective. For people, we only test for the Lyme organism. That is an option. Let's take a little closer at the actual tick feeding process. Ticks are not like mosquitoes. They don't have these hypothermic mouth parts that come in, you know, get in the capillary, feed for about two minutes, and they're gone. They have to set those mouth parts. A nymphal deer tick requires four days for full engorgement, and a female deer tick requires five to seven days for full engorgement before they drop off on their own. So they're there for days, either noticed or not noticed. Okay? So if you look at the head, so-called head of a tick, you've got the palps, which are sensory in function. You have the central mouth part structure, which are what we call chillus, which uses the teeth that the tick uses to cut into the skin. This is like a lower lip with all these little weak curved teeth in it. And that's the mouth parts in the upper corner of the mouth of the tick. Again, the three parts, the two chelicerae and the hypostome, which is like a lower lip. When a tick cuts into the skin, this is a cross-section of skin, this is the epidermis. The tick inserts the mouth parts, it actually secretes the cement-like material. That sort of moves itself to you. Dog ticks, actually, as big as they are, have very short mouth parts. Do you remember, anybody here know dog ticks are? They really seem embedded, don't they? But they're actually, the actual penetration of the skin is not that deep. But they secrete a lot of that cement. Deer ticks don't secrete that much. But what they do is after they get the mouth part set, they secrete a lot of pharmacologically active materials, proteases, vasodilators, immune suppressive compounds, anticoagulants, and they create this microscopic lesion under the skin. So the tick attaches, it's spitting, it creates this, the blood pools into that, and then it sucks it up. Now the Lyme spirochetes are actually way up in the body and the gut of the tick. As the blood meal begins, those spirochetes begin to multiply. And they actually have to penetrate the gut wall of the tick and travel through the body to the salivary glands before they can be inoculated into you. And that takes time. So if we look at the tick and cross-section, again, here's a, this kind of a diagrammatic drawing here. The mouth parts are down in the skin. Here's that feeding lesion. Here's the tick on the surface. And the yeah, uh, green is the spirochetes. They migrate through the body wall to the uh, salivary glands to get injected in. And there's actually a change, too. The spirochete expresses different outer surface proteins. It's expressive what we call outer surface protein A, it's an adhesion molecule to hold on to the tick gut. But as it migrates through, it quits making that and starts making this out of surface protein C. In other words, it's preparing itself to change from a tick environment to a mammal host environment, for example. And it has to express that off C to be infectious. If the spirochete does not express off C, it can't infect it. So that's why it takes time for transmission. So what this chart shows is the probability of an infected tick transmitting the Lyme spirochetes and how many hours it's been attached. So at 24 hours, if the tick, even if the tick's infected, your chances of getting Lyme disease from that tick after 24 hours is zero. By 48 hours, two full days of attachment, it's 12%. Then you'll notice it really starts to increase after that, but that's because at that point, that's when the spirochetes are really pouring into the salivary glands, not uh, aiding transmission. So that's why those tick checks are so important. When does the red circle begin? I'll, I'll get to that okay. in a moment. So in terms of how many are actually infected, this summarizes the results of the testing of the ticks that have come into the experiment station from uh, Connecticut residents. Uh, here, since 2005 through 2011, we've tested, as you can see, nymphal ticks over 7,000, 8,000 nymphal ticks, and uh, over 7,000 adult ticks. 
And you can see the overall average infection rate was about 24, almost 25 percent in the nymphs and about 31 um, percent in the adults. But you can see, if you look at it, it does fluctuate quite a bit from year to year. Here it was about 41 percent. This year it was about 16 overall on average. It tends to alternate from year to year, high year, low year, high year, low year. <coughs> so, um, so about every tick is infected. But, what if you're unlucky, you didn't notice the tick, or you didn't get it off in time, and it was one that was infected, you will, of course, get Lyme disease. Early symptoms is what we call the erythema migrans, which is the expanding red rash at the site of the tick bite. Uh, probably about 70, 80% of people will have that rash. About 15% of those people will have multiple rashes as the spirochete spreads through the skin. You can actually do a biopsy, that's not going well done, but you can actually do a biopsy at the leading edge of the rash and recover the spirochete. Now, if you don't do anything, it'll resolve on its own in about four weeks. The rash itself shows up anywhere from a few days to a month after the tick bite. It's a slowly expanding rash. The average is about a week to nine days. So again, it will expand. It can be as big as a dinner plate. And its shape will vary depending on where in the body it is. And it'll fade and go back. While with or without the rash, you may likely to have symptoms that are similar to a viral infection. Fatigue, muscle and joint plenty, pain, you just feel lousy. It's summer flu, but not with any respiratory involvement. Okay, so if you really feel lousy in the summer, it's just something to think about, you know, in terms of what you might have. And that's the time to get treated. So here's some examples of the rash. It's commonly red throughout. It may clear in the center. But the so-called your bullseye with multiple rings is actually not a real common form. Only about 15% of the rashes will actually take on that kind of characteristics, you know, like that. So it'll vary depending on the where on it is. If the tick was feeding in your head, you may not notice it. If it's in your back and you're single, you may not even notice it. It's rarely itchy. It can be warm to the touch. But it's conceivable you can even miss it. You know, it's not on an obvious part of your body. And again, it will fade. And then as time goes by, as the spider keeps spreads through the body, it has a tendency to go to nervous tissue, skin tissue, and joint tissue. So about 60%, 50 to 60% of people, which means 40 to 50 do not, will develop a form of arthritis. And it can be somewhat crippling. And it fluctuates. It often attacks the large joints like the knee. So you'll have a knee that flares up, you can't walk on it, it can fade. And then your other knee will flare up. So that is what they mean. It's a migratory, it can be a migratory um, arthritis sometimes. About 10% of people will develop neurological Lyme symptoms. This is why our key gets into the nervous uh, system, nervous tissue. Bell's palsy, which is paralysis of your facial muscles, is one of the most common early manifestations of neurologic life. But you'll see, not everybody gets that. But headaches, stiff neck, numbness in your extremities, if it gets into the central nervous system, some individuals not as common will have forgetfulness, personality change, and cognitive impairment issues as well. And then there's a small proportion of people, about 5 to 8 percent, where spirochete actually gets to the heart and it'll cause uh, metroventricular block. All is treatable at any of these stages, but early treatment is important. Now, I want to go quickly over the testing for Lyme. One thing you got to understand is the test, there's no really easy way to actually test for the organism itself. I mean, we think like strep throat, you go in and you get a culture made and they actually look for the bacteria. There's no good way to do that. All these symptoms are triggered by relatively few spirochetes. So actually recovering or finding the spirochetes in an infected person is very difficult. So it's not used as a diagnostic method. But it doesn't work. So it relies on, and a lot of other tests do the same thing, it relies on your immune response. You're testing for the antibodies that you produce as a result of the infection. And that will depend on your immune response. But generally, most people that are in active in Lyme infection will develop a strong antibody test, uh, reaction, and we will be tested for that. So
So there's two, two parts of that. First is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. And, this, and if that is positive, then they'll conduct what they call a Western immunoblock. If the enzyme-linked immunoassay is negative, that's the end of the testing. Now that test happens to be uh, fairly sensitive, but not real specific. So you can get false positives with it. But it's, it's sensitive enough that if you've, if you've got it, it'll show up. So that's the end of that. Um, but if it's positive, you know, what they're going to do, is, since you have false positives, since, like I said, it's not real sensitive, uh, they'll do that Western uh, immunoblot, or Western blot, and then they'll actually look for these IgM or IgG antibodies that, you know, show up from six to eight weeks in the case of IgG uh, antibodies develop in four to eight weeks, and they peak in about four to six months. And when and it takes time, about, you know, around four weeks to develop antibody titers and be detected by the test. So that's a fallacy. You can have all of the classic symptoms of Lyme disease and have negative tests. Because you have to develop a titer or a level of antibody sufficient to be tested. And these antibody titers can persist for years. So you can be treated. And if you're treated right away, sometimes it'll abort the antibody response and you won't never develop an antibody response because you've knocked it out early enough. Uh, but you can also have a history, you can uh, continue to have a positive Lyme test even if the therapy is successful. And by that I mean you just don't have any further symptoms or problems. Now, I just want to briefly go into the Lyme ring is not the only thing that the tick carries. The tick carries two other pathogens around here. They're not as common as Lyme, but they do occur. And it's anaplasmosis is one, or lichiosis is closely related. This is an influenza-like illness, and it varies in severity, and the, these bacteria invade the white blood cells. The anaplasma, phagocytophilum, this bacteria attacks a type of blood, blood cell called a granulocyte. And then the uh, Ehrlichia chaffiensis, which is actually carried by the Lone Star tick, um, causes a monocytic Ehrlichiosis. And as you can see, we don't have as many cases, at least reported. We don't know what the true incidence is, but you can see it's just under 50 cases that are reported every year. Dr. Stucker, do vets report at all? No. Because I'm hearing a lot more anaplasmosis. It's around, and dogs can get it as well. I'm hearing a lot. Recently, yeah. right. It's increasing, but the problem is the symptoms vary a lot. There are people that get it and have very mild symptoms, and some people get very severely ill. And often it's difficult to diagnose, but it responds extremely quickly to antibiotics. So the symptoms are very general. You have fever, malaise, might, you know, muscle pain, shaking chills and sweats and headache, occasionally some nausea. The symptoms can be very mild or very severe. There's no obvious symptom like a rash or something that can clue in on that. But you will probably see in a lab test they run a decrease in your white blood cell count and platelet count. Uh, the drug of choice is doxycycline or tetracycline, and the response is very rapid because these over there bacteria in your white blood cells are readily exposed to the antibiotics when you're treated with it, and it resolves very quickly. Uh, Bezoiosis is a little different. This is a protozoan organism, so it's like having malaria. It attacks your red blood cells. It is a parasite of the rodent blood cells, but it will attack human red blood cells. And again, it's spread by a hard like when you take a deer tick. It has been present for a long time on Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, Shelter Island, parts of other parts of Long Island. It was first introduced in Connecticut in 1988 in the Stonington area and has been expanding ever since, but most of the cases still occur in London County. And you can have co-infection with any of these. You can have a tick, one tick transmit then more than one of these pathogens in one time. That can complicate the diagnostic picture. If you look at the human babesiosis cases in Connecticut, you can see that the majority of them here are in New London County, shown here in red. And then here in blue is the remainder of Connecticut. Number of cases varies, you know, from 40 all the way up to uh, nearly 160 a year. Now, with this disease, 
And like I said, most of, them, most of the cases, the greatest incidence still occurs in New London County, but it is spreading through the state as well as up the Hudson River uh, uh, Valley as well. Now, the interesting thing about this is this illness is often self-limited. It's kind of interesting. You've got people that range from no clinical symptoms of it at all to people who die. Now, that's quite a range. So what happens is it's actually most severe in people that are older or if they're immunosuppressed or they don't have a spleen. So like I said, subclinical infection, mild flu-like illness to a fulminating disease resulting in death. Mortality rates about five to nine percent. Uh, the incubation period means between tick bite and the time when you guys start getting sick is one to six weeks. Again, it's fatigue, chills, sweats. Uh, there have been cases but blood transfusion as well, since it's in the red blood cells. And it's a different set of drugs that are used to treat it, like I said, psychiatric malaria. In real severe cases, they'll do an exchange of blood transfusion. So those are the three main diseases that you have to deal with. And pets can get these as well. You know, pet, pets are picking up ticks all the time. They can get Lyme disease, they can get anaplasmosis, they can get babesiosis, but mainly it's Lyme and anaplasmosis. Uh, what I'm talking about there is a couple things that you can do to reduce your risk on dogs. I understand it. Any outside dog is going to pick up ticks and get infected with a Lyme organism. Most dogs do not get clinically ill. Only about 5% of all exposed dogs actually get severely ill. And then actually in the very early days of Lyme disease, uh, canine sero surveys where you actually did blood tests on dogs in new areas was done because dogs were out there. They were a very sensitive way to pick up Lyme when it was newly emerging at very low levels in the area. So before anybody noticed any ticks, because the dogs would pick them up. Before humans did, you started seeing human cases, you could, you'd find the dogs were negative, negative, and all of a sudden you start getting positive dogs. So you knew the Lyme was moving into that area. So that was in the early years. So here's a canine vaccine against Borrelia burgdorferi, the uh, Lyme disease uh, spirochete. And of course, they're treated with antibiotics just like people are. And as I said, most dogs will become infected, 5% develop clinical signs. It generally, it'll show acute or subacute arthritis, lameness, fever, and as mentioned, uncommon is renal failure, Lyme nephritis. Chronic signs are very rare. And with nephritis, once the dog develops those symptoms, there's very little of that, unfortunately, can do the same thing. Vaccinate and treat. Uh, again, they're treated with antibiotics just like humans are. This is a summary of the various tick products that can be used against ticks for pets, most for dogs only. There's only a few that can be used on cats. Probably the one on the front line is one that most people are probably uh, familiar with. Marielle's coming out with has come out with a new product called Certifect, which is Fipronil. They invited Amitraz to it as well, which is a contact uh, insecticide. Uh, Fipronil uh, takes time to take effect. It will kill the ticks, but it's not a immediate contact uh, toxic. And then you also have the option of vaccinating your dog. There's two types of vaccine. There's a whole cell Bactrim vaccine, which is basically a killed organism. And then you have the recombinant out of surface protein A vaccine, which is very similar to what the human vaccine was. There is a human vaccine for it was for a brief time. Okay. It was made available, it was tested, uh, approved, and then it was around for a few years, and then it was taken off the market in 2002 by GlaxoSmithKline, mainly for marketing reasons. However, there were allegations the vaccine was causing arthritis and other problems, which were never really substantiated. And there was a class action lawsuit against the company as well, uh, make, make allegations of these uh, uh, severe side effects. And so they figured they were only going to sell about 10,000 doses in, in 2002. That wasn't enough to sustain the product. And they pulled the Are there natural um, remedies for keeping ticks off animals other than, you know, chemicals? Uh, um, plants or you know, not real effectively. Okay. 
there's no natural something that grows in nature that could be rubbed on a dog like there are things that and not well it's you're, you're, there's some things that have repellent properties but you're, you're going to be trading some some, some efficacy there quite a lot with that um, if, so i would say you know so your two options are either use some of those other products and then also vaccinate the animal how effective are the vaccines? The vaccines are probably around 90-95 percent effective. I mean, there's hardly any vaccine that's 100 percent effective. There's a few that come close, but you know, again, it, it depends on your your uh, response to the to the vaccine to mount that immune response. Mm -hmm. And with the human line vaccine, they actually found you needed three boost, three shots, and would probably need a booster every two years. So one of the big things about Lyme is it's primarily what we call a paradomestic disease. We figure most people pick it up in activities right around the yard. You can pick it up hiking, camping, that kind of thing. Most are the ticks in the woods. A lot of them are on the edge, and only about 2% of the yard. And actually, interestingly, I found that about 82% of the nymphs are within about 3 meters to 3 yards of the line edge. Remember, they don't like open, hot, sunny conditions. So in a typical yard, it's the woods, the wood edge, ground cover, but not your sunny open front yard. Not just the lawn. Not the middle of the lawn. Okay. So we estimated about in one study survey about seventy-five percent of the ticks were picked up outdoors at home, and these were surveys of people that were submitting ticks for testing. Play was identified at forty-seven percent of the uh, of the submissions as the activity where the tick was picked up. Garden work eighteen percent. Gardening twelve percent. Going off to somebody else's house for us. So that's a high risk activity. So how can you manage this? You can reduce the number of ticks by mowing, pruning, clearing brush, restricting where your ground cover is. I have picked ticks off and picked up ticks with pepper sand right off people's porches. So you don't have to go in the woods. Um, so this is a property that in a whole line where we did some work, quite a few ticks, you know, by opening it up. It's a little more sunny, uh, putting in a wood chip barrier. There were still ticks in the woods, but the numbers actually out into the lawn when the kids were playing were reduced by 90%. Wow. So if they chase the ball out in the woods, all bets are off, but you know, you've lessened your chances of picking them up just right there. So just that wood chip barrier makes a big difference. It can make a difference if it's maintained. And then of course, mm -hmm. where uh, quite commonly where are swing sets placed? Mm -hmm. In the woods, right? What we call the tick up. So I understand why people do that in the hot summer, you know, stuff for it, but something like from a tick standpoint is your risk, something out more in the center of the yard would be more appropriate. So the idea is to create an environment where think of the woods as your tick zone. That's your habitat where the wildlife and the animals are and where the ticks are. And what you want to do is landscape and provide a barrier to reduce the number of ticks coming into the area of the yard where the family spends most of the time. That's the concept. Watch out for the tick right off the edge. As an aside, as far as landscaping goes, some studies that were done, uh, you know, at the by the experiment station, mainly by Dr. Scott Williams and Jeff Ward, uh, they were looking at methods to control barberry. Uh, barberry, of course, is invasive. It's you know a lot of our woods. You can see the picture up there, just carpeted, you know, with it. We don't get any forest regeneration. Uh, but what they found when they started uh, managing this barberry, and they were kind of trying to come up with non-chemical methods to do it by mechanical uh, cutting and then burning the base with a propane torch to kill it, they found that there was a lot of ticks in that barberry. I've seen this before, no surprise. And so what they found is when they re controlled the barberry, the number of ticks dropped dramatically. So there's some other studies in Maine that have also linked invasive plants with higher tick population because it provides a proper environmental cover and the dense stands of library also provide greater protection for the mice and chipmunks and you have fewer uh, cutters accessing the animals. So here, if you look at here, just the relative number density of ticks that are infected in those plots where the barberry was being controlled, areas with full barberry, much higher than where they control the barberry versus where there was no barberry to begin with. 
So having a dense park area in the woods behind your home is a risk factor for greater tick numbers. You can spray. They are the most, uh, the most common ornamental turf insecticides are actually synthetic pyrethroids. I will say they are extremely effective. Ticks do not have resistance to it. You will kill a lot of ticks if you make the spray application. So that is an option. And there's a lot of people that actually do that. Uh, the natural pyrethroids I found will work, but the only if you use propanol and metoxide, this is a synergist, and, and mix it with insecticide itself. But what I focused on uh, lately is uh, pathogenic fungi and some natural compounds as alternatives to synthetic chemicals. So the fungus, two fungus, Bavaria bassiana, metarizium anisophily, mainly metarizium is what I've been working with. Uh, these are naturally occurring insect fungi in the soil at low, and they occur at low levels. But the idea is that you produce this in mass and spray the spores out in the environment to increase the numbers of the ticks we'll encounter in the environment. <coughs> There's a female tick that's been killed by this fungus. The pinnidae or spores adhere to the tick and germinate. They penetrate the cuticle of the tick, grow, and it ends up killing uh, the tick, and then you get more sporulation. So it's basically you spray this uh, uh, fungus suspension just like you would an insecticide. It's quite safe, actually. The studies have been published. I've done that. I found that the very Dastiana, which is mainly used in greenhouses for other kinds of insects, provides 38 to 75 percent control, while the midterizium provided 53 to 74 percent control at the lower rate that we uh, applied it at. So. The company Novozymes Biological Inc. is developing this product under the label Tick X. Uh, it is actually quite safe for non-target organisms like honeybees, lady beetles, green lacewings, parasitic uh, wasps, earthworms. Uh, beetles tend to be a little more susceptible to this, so it's also labeled for drug control. Um, it has full EPA registration, and it's registered in all states, and they plan to have full launch of this product commercially. Butterflies? Hmm? Butterflies? Not butterflies. I've also spent a few years looking at a compound called Nougaton. This is a component of the essential oil of Alaska yellow cedar. You can also get it from grapefruit. It is used uh, by, as an additive by the food industry and cosmetic industry. It has, you know, it's quite safe. There's a synthetic version available as well. Um, it's repellent and toxicant uh, to ticks. Um, it's also horrendously expensive for this use in very small amounts, you know, by those industries. Uh, it doesn't last very volatile, it doesn't last very long, so we've been doing some research trying to encapsulate it and actually try it uh, in, at homes uh, as an alternative. And what we found is, is on my studies, we got 100% control with the Nougaton for up to four weeks after we applied the first year, 80% the second year, but most of it was gone after one week. Studies with my colleagues in New Jersey who are also running some trials, they got 100% control for a lot longer when they used a 600 PSI sprayer, which is not typically what you would see. They blasted the rocks. See, what happens is this volatile and it doesn't last very long. In other words, yeah. with the synthetic insecticides, you have a residual action. Not all the ticks quest at the same time. They're down in the leaf litter. So you spray, you kill the ticks up there. The ticks that come up to quest later, there's a residual activity and they're killed. But with these natural compounds, which don't last at all, very long at all, they're gone by the time those other ticks come up. So you'll be able to control for a few weeks until those other ticks start coming up looking for those. So you need residual. But what they did with that high pressure sprayer is, is they basically got all the ticks. I mean, leaves were flying. But that's not typically what you're going uh, to see in an ordinary application. And I'll just to give you a reference point, my applications of uh, cooperating homeowners uh, that were working with me cost me $16,000 just for the 
Well, right now it's repellent, so right now there is work underway to develop it as a human repellent. Another repellent is a uh, an alternative to deep. Okay, because you don't need as much. But again, when you're spraying it, you need a lot of it. Right. So I don't see that going anywhere, at least as an uh, uh, area-wide, but I do see it being developed as a, as a repellent to be used. Okay. I've also been looking at some um, what they call minimum risk pesticides. These are compounds that are exempt by the EPA under Section 25B of the uh, Federal Insecticide, mm -hmm. Fungicide, and Rubicide Act, FIFRA. And what it is is these compounds, and actually the companies can market these things without any testing that or proof that they work. So you'll see these things marketed a lot. And so Mosquito Barrier, one brand, is garlic juice. Eco Exempt is a company that has a, a rosemary oil, peppermint oil product. I've tested the garlic a couple of years. I was going to also try it again this year, but I didn't have enough ticks. I'm probably the only person that's actually wow. have lots of ticks out there. The tick numbers in our yard uh, at the homeowners that we were working with were so low this year I couldn't conduct the trial. So uh, and I wanted to have another year's uh, data to go with this. I had the same problem last year. But the garlic. We did seem to suppress the tick activity for two to three weeks. The eco exam, they got 100% uh, control for about two weeks after they applied it as well. I used to go with the dogs. And I so, yeah. Basically, so, I'm the, so we find we find it's a spray application. We're seeing suppression in the lab. It does not kill, but it does repel. Right. Yeah. And we, we yes. find that in the lab. So that's one possible. Uh, safer uh, you know, option that could be used. So to summarize this, the fungus is very, is quite, you know, fairly effective. It will be coming out in the market in 2014. The garlic and rosemary products appear to suppress tick activity for about one to two weeks, so you'll have to make repeated applications. That's the trade-off as opposed to one application with a chemical insecticide. And again, uh, that will be available in 2014, the fungus that is. So there are some alternatives to managing the landscape. Another approach is host-targeted tick control. The main focus has been white-tailed deer and white-footed mouse using bait boxes. Or there's also a product called Damnex, which is the cotton ball. Uh, I'm sure that we can treat the cotton balls in tubes. Uh, white-tailed deer, excluding the deer, reducing the deer, and treating the deer are all approaches that Remember, deer key to not to the how they are infected, but how many ticks that you have. So the first studies I did back in the early 1900s was looking at what impact fencing does. And these are some homes that had seven strand high tensile electric deer fences, and of course you the deer coming again with the female ticks to lay eggs, you get no larvae inside those properties. You had 84% fewer nymphal ticks and 74% fewer adult ticks. And most of those were collected just inside, not stopping small animal movement, not way inside the fence. So fencing them out just on a scale of acres has a significant impact on the number of ticks inside. So fencing is a method to control access of deer to a property. You can use an electric fence or a non-electric fence. Now, another approach that's been tried is with this product, which is now coming back on the market. I spent several years testing this, working with CDC did too. Uh, the original trials were on Mason's Island, and I did studies at home in Westport Weston. Uh, it's Fipronil. Same thing that you use in frontline dogs and cats. There's a little wick inside the box. The mice, come, mice and chipmunks come in. They get treated. It works fantastic kill all the ticks and the mice and chipmunks. So what you're doing so is those animals are going around picking up ticks and killing them instead of picking up ticks and infecting them. And so on Mason's Island, which is where we originally, the bait box approach was first tested, they had a big tick problem. They wiped out the ticks. How many thousands of boxes? A lot of boxes. <laughs> The trick is you're putting these out about every 30 to 60 feet because mice have a home range of only about half an acre. There's deer have a home range of many hundreds of acres. So it's a scale issue in terms of the 
hosts that you're targeting with those approaches. But it doesn't work, it will work. Now actually what happened was when we did our original trials with this, squirrels started breaking into the boxes to get to the non-toxic bake block. Then the EPA got all kind of uh, upset about the fact we were exposing that fipronil wick, although the dosage is much lower than what you use actually in the top spot for dogs and cats. So they required a metal shroud at nine dollars a box. It got so expensive that Bayer, who was making this product, quit making it. They just dropped it. That was the end of that. But now it's becoming commercially available. Other companies picked it up. They don't require this metal shield. They realized that was unnecessary. And so the product is coming back on the market, which is why I'm mentioning it tonight. Again, they're placed about every 30 or 60 feet around the perimeter of the property. But to really have an impact with this, it's really going to rely on your neighbor over here also putting boxes around their property, and your neighbor up here putting boxes around them. Yes. So you're getting that whole neighborhood. All the uh, mice and chipmunks are getting treated, and in that case, it will have an impact. An individual home, I don't think so. So what are the current options right now? You've got landscape practices, you have chemical insecticides, the host targeted parasites, you haven't seen a whole lot of use of those, but the big boxes are coming back. One deer management's an issue. One thing I didn't cover in here is a deer uh, deer uh, station where the deer come up to rollers and are treated and kill the ticks on the deer. Um, natural tick control, we have the fungi and some promising botanical compounds. Some more exotic work involves oral vaccines for the mice. Um, and antibiotics for the, uh, for the mice as well, and really esoteric research is looking at anti-tick vaccines. You do a vaccine to make any tick that feeds on your diet. Hmm. So that's basically where tick control research lies today. I want to acknowledge partners and my summer assistants that, that really helped get this uh, work you know, done. A lot of this information is available on our tick management handbook, which I brought copies of. Uh, and it's also available on our website, uh, the Medical Experiment Station. And that concludes my talk, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. Any more questions? I was going to ask you about how effective are ground birds, such as wild turkeys, in eradicating chicks or chickens? I mean, are they effective? If, if Probably not that effective. Um, there's not a lot of data with that, but what little studies have been done don't indicate that they have a huge impact, and you're talking about high densities of the birds. Um, birds, remember, themselves also serve as hosts okay. for the larval and nymphal stages of the tick. Um, one possibility is that, think about the engorged female ticks. Now, they're relatively large. We know they won't feed on unfed tick. Those trials have been done. Turkey will not feed on the adult female tick. But an engorged one down in that leaf litter would be vulnerable. So if they eat those, you'd have a similar uh, suppression of, uh, effect as you would with the fencing. You eliminate that female, she's not laying eggs, you're going to you know, drop her and not put a hit on the life cycle. Do birds normally go after ticks? We know you've got no, except for what you may have heard about, like in Africa, the oxpecker, which is on the antelope or the you know cattle there in Africa, and actually you know actually take them off, take them off, pick them off and you feed on the ticks and other parasites on, on those animals. I wanted to ask you too about if you have had Lyme disease, this is now in your system, right? I mean, it will always show up in your blood. Testing. Well, then, uh, well, no, the antibody. You talk about the antibody titers or the actual organ, uh, actual infection. If, they, if you get, if you catch it early and get treated mm -hmm. the proper course of antibiotics, you will eliminate it, and that'll be the end of it. Okay. There's a lot of controversy about its persistence and people that do not get treated right away uh, continue to have problems. But uh, I would say the early treatments. The antibodies, and that's true of other diseases as well, I mean, once you have it, the antibody titers will, will stay elevated for, for a long time before they slowly drop off. 
The fact that you didn't have continued validated antibodies, vaccine wouldn't work. Right, but as you get older too, and your immune system is not as as good as it was, does this now show up again? Is it there? All you talk well, basically what you're talking about is it a latent infection yeah. uh, or not? And that's an area that gets you know it gets a little controversial whether there's chronic or persistent Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a little evidence that it can occur. There's other evidence that suggests it isn't. That is probably the leading area of contention in the Lyme disease community right now. And uh, hopefully some additional research will finally resolve that someday. Um, that's why I'm saying prevention and uh, getting early diagnosis and getting that early treatment is really important. Because that will prevent all the subsequent symptoms. But you notice those other diseases like anaplasmosis and babesiosis, your risk of developing severe illness with those two pathogens increases dramatically with age. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. I had a tick bite. Went to the doctor and he said, based on what you were saying, I understand. He said, it's not going to show up. If I took a blood test right now, you're not going to see it because I just... It was within 48 hours. When he started an antibiotic regimen, he says, you're better off to do this without the test rather than wait four weeks or six weeks to get the test and then start it. So he did the antibiotic regimen right away, and six weeks later the test came back positive, and he said, you have no other symptoms, everything seems to be fine. But he says you'll always test positive. Well, it won't be always, but it'll be a long time. You know, in other words, it will it'll take years, but it will slowly that response, you know, your antibody level will slowly decline. Unless you get infected again. These antibodies provide no lasting immunity. The antibodies that are produced uh, in the normal course of infection actually do eliminate a lot of spirochetes, but it doesn't give it all that so you continue to develop the disease. But the um, but they will drop you know, over time. Mm -hmm. Is it true you can or cannot um, give blood if you had you, Yeah, you can give blood. You what you can, all one thing you cannot give blood is babesiosis. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been diagnosed with babesiosis, you cannot give blood again. <clears throat> because there have been, there's not a good test for that. Uh, if you've got you know, a long questionnaire you fill out on your, you know, what you've had in your uh, behavioral practices and all this other kind of stuff when you donate blood, there's one line in there so we'll ask you if you've ever been diagnosed with babesiosis. If you say yes, that's it's on the it. Because they don't have a blood test right now. They don't, have, they don't screen the blood donations with that easy or And that was one of the habit of human transfusion cases. Any other questions? Well, this doesn't have anything to do with Lyme disease, but mad cow disease, is this, does this run the same way? My, my daughter was in England for six months, and now they won't take her blood because she was there. And Still, I mean, there was a window there where that was very true. Yeah, and then she was in the 80s, she was there. That, that's it. See, that was the window when they think that exposure occurred. But the interesting thing about that is, you know, they were anticipating a certain number of human cases, unfortunately, a lot of those cases never materialized. Is that the same kind of bacteria? Or no, no, about? it's actually not a bacteria. It's not a bacteria. Mad cow disease is caused by a protein. It's called a prion. It's a misshape of the protein that has the characteristic of uh, being able to trigger normal proteins to also take that shape. So it's kind of unique. It was first recognized it's a cure, uh, we have a cure Peru in the beginning, in the cattle's, and it's in the nervous tissue, and so they would, when somebody died, there was a ritual eating of the brains and other tissues. Mainly it was the female members of the family that did this part, and that's it's just part of the, the, the funeral um, process, and um, of course they would be picking up the, the, the and then they would develop. 
sheep scrappy is the same. I think cow, uh, mad cow disease scrappy is another prion disease in sheep. It's been around for a long time, but it happens not transmitted to humans. But they think there was a period there when they were actually using animal remains in the feed for cattle. So that's one idea how it got introduced. And um, they ended up with that cow disease. Anyone else? Thank you again. You're this welcome. is fascinating. Um, just to remind everybody, no seminar next month. The Nature Center's closed that week. But do come back in October because we have Jerry Griswold coming back with a bat chat. Yes, she will be bringing her bat. So, <laughs> so come along. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, and have a great night. Thank you very much. Don't pick yourself the ticks. Don't vaccinate your dogs. <laughs> and thank you again. <laughs> Seventy percent of people get it from the nose because it's active in the summer and because it's so small. That's amazing. You'd never even think you had anything on you. The female is a little more noticeable. Yeah. And uh, she and of course and of course mm -hmm. as long as it's in a spot gorged, that you can see, you know. Well, that's it. Too. Yeah. I mean that. That's amazing. So no wonder we miss it in the mm -hmm. animals so often because the there's just no way that you'd be able to yeah. tell tell that. Yeah. yeah. So. Wow. That's why I like using this. Now, if you have outside. something like that on you, after you've been outside, obviously taking a shower, that just comes right off. No. no. If it's attached, it's not going to come off. Well, I'm going to get stuck. That's Whoa, the time. Rub it off. Oh, yeah, no, that's the time. with the test check. And then if you find the one, test the one. Mm -hmm. So, so but that your body. Well, now, for example, the closest call I've ever had to what I did was a long time ago. Um, I had one that I found, you know, on my back and my shoulder here, and it was partially engorged. Um, by the degree of engorgement, I knew I had it like, that day. It had to be from the day before. So it had been on me since over 24 hours. Okay, but not yet 48 hours, 24 hours. So I tested it. It was full of spirochetes. Okay. But I didn't get infected. So I caught it at that point where they were multiplying in the gut, but did not yet reach the salivary. So another day, so that's the closest yeah. one. That's the closest call I've had. But I've had very few points. The permethrin, the permethrin, which is an insect, 5.5% permethrin, that's an insecticide. Insecticide, which is used on your clothes, you fly it to your clothes, and uh, it kills it by in contact with it. So it's something to seriously consider if you're doing high risk activities and you know that ticks. You know, you've got some special hard clothes, yard work, you know, things like that. You did have to have a circle of the Well, there was a fit that was very steady. Any big bite, you know, for anything. Nickel or dying or something like that. But I put a stick on my soda. You have other diseases that you've got over there. We do get them. I mentioned a section in my handbook. But it was like, I found an east end on my son's way. And he's out in the woods. 
Our socks kind of stuff, but I we're working on a project where we were doing a basic plant removal. 